everybody. Welcome back. I'm glad you could join me today again for another adventure in the American desert southwest, the deserts. While we sometimes generalize the vast regions of the American southwest as desert, true deserts are actually defined more so by low annual precipitation amount below 3,500 feet or around 1,100 meters elevation. And they consist of small shrubs and trees, and of course, the characteristic cacti like those you see behind me today. Uh-oh, Choya. Here in the Sonoran Desert and much of the American West, we find outcrops of rocks that look like this. These are carbonates, or limestones and dolomites. These limestones and dolomites are mostly made up of carbonate minerals, like calcite. The mineral you see here, which is in the form of something we call sparry calcite, or dog tooth spar. The calcium in these deposits is easily dissolved out by the work of rainwater, and in these regions, calcium is continuously added to the soil, where the calcium can combine with carbon dioxide and soil particles to form a hard, insoluble layer known as caliche. Caliche is basically a natural cement that can form at or below the surface in desert soils, and anyone who's ever tried to dig or plant in this stuff knows that it can be a nearly impenetrable barrier, and desert plants have to work their roots around them. Ooh, look what we have here. Another fun fact about caliche is it fluoresces, much like the scorpions in the desert, who you see here fluorescing in the green. You can also see orange blobs around it. Those are pieces of caliche fluorescing orange, like the mineral calcite. You can shine a UV light at night in the desert. I'll drop a link to a great UV flashlight in the description. Wow! It's easy to miss the subtleties of the desert floor unless we touch our noses to the ground, where we might be surprised in places like the wet Sonoran Desert to find lichens and mosses forming a living soil cover otherwise known as biocrust. This biocrust is extremely important for holding sediment in place, keeping it from going airborne, and even keeping us protected from a spreading western disease known as valley fever. If you'd like to dive deeper into biocrust, particulate matter, and valley fever, well, just check out some of the other discussions that I've done here at Let's Go Geo. Another common feature in these deserts are the washes, or arroyos. These are quite large features on the landscape, and they account for a lot of the sediment that moves from the surrounding mountains. But you'll often find them as dry washes, either due to the ephemeral desert precipitation patterns or sometimes human alterations. But when it does rain, these washes can flow. These deserts or arid regions go through periods of dry and wet cycles, sometimes related to seasonal shifts in precipitation, and in the case of the Sonoran Desert, monsoons. And when a storm comes through, these otherwise dry washes can literally turn into rivers. Shown here is a flash flood I experienced in Utah, it's where these flash floods are particularly dangerous in narrow slot canyons and where the soil is clay. All right, the aftermath of the mud flow. It was kind of a flash river. <laughs> cool things left behind after the little wash flood here. Uh, this wall shows that lots of water was flowing over the wall too and parts of it were caving in. That's just going to add more sediment to the water that's coming down to whatever else is already that it's picked up along the way including debris these are called ripple marks rightfully named kind of a an easier named item because they definitely look rippled right kind of like waves almost like ripply they're formed from the water flowing across or, or over them over the mud that was here already if you had to draw this shape so you see that right here they're kind of going sort of up and down and up and down and up and down right those are the ripple marks they're not symmetrical and that's the shape that tells us the water was flowing this way we could literally infer the direction of the river flow here we could infer that it went this way across these ripple marks and that becomes interesting because then we know the direction that the river was flowing from many many millions of years ago and you might be able to infer some other information about the environment from that. So 
That's why ribble marks are so cool. Aside from just looking cool and being really fun to play in, they tell us a lot of information. Here in the Mojave Desert, near Death Valley, we can walk across these massive, fan-shaped piles of rocks. Many of the mountains you see around me and to the north are a product of those basin and range extensional forces, which means they're bounded by normal faults and display those typical triangular facets. Now, spewing out of the canyons of those mountains are piles of ancient rocks. And out of the mouths are these boulders that can be bigger than me. Must have been some force to move them. These fan-shaped features are called alluvial fans, and these can be really big. I mean really big. I mean really, really big. You know, let's take an aerial view to get a better perspective. From up here, you can really see how everything washes down the alluvial fan. It's interesting because it looks rather flat from this vantage point, but that's actually sloping just like the mountains over there where the, those fans are coming out. All that sediment is eroding out of these mountains, just like here, but it just continuously piles sediments up, meaning that this is actually much higher here and then it fans out. That's why they're called alluvial fans. If you want to learn more about alluvial fans, I did a whole thing on alluvial fans here. Check that out. Now, as I've been walking across this alluvial fan, I'm walking across these dark blackish looking rocks. But these rocks actually aren't black. Most of them are much lighter. If we look at the bottom or break open a fresh surface, we'll see. But this is actually just a surface coating. Desert varnish is this dark coating commonly found on rocks in arid regions. This coating contains a mixture, principally of manganese, iron, and some other material. And it gets deposited on the surface of these rocks through the action of blowing wind, water, and the action of living organisms like fungi and bacteria. One of the many fascinating things about desert varnish is what we can learn about the climate past as well as the age of rocks. The varnish tells us something about how old the rocks are relative to other rocks. And I talked all about this when we did a virtual adventure on an alluvial fan. Desert varnish is also responsible for the creation of pictographs because this dark material once picked off leaves a lighter material behind. From way up here, we can see the whole basin. And in the basin, if you look hard enough, you see some piles of sand. Those are actually really large sand dunes. Let's go down and check them Led out. Led Zeppelin correctly identified that mountains crumble to the sea. And these surrounding mountains sure provide a lot of sediment or sand, which as you can see here, is rather difficult to climb. That was a lot steeper than it looked. All of the sediment piles up at the base of the mountains to form sand dunes, and wind is one of the key driving factors of the types and shapes of sand dunes. As you can see in this McKee diagram, factors such as wind speed and direction, as well as sand supply, can lead to six or seven key sand dune shapes from domes to stars. Aeolian features, or otherwise features formed by the wind, are common in desert environments. Some interesting examples include yardangs and zugans, which are ridges and troughs created by erosion, the difference between the two depending on the direction of the underlying rock types, where yardangs are the product of vertical strata and zugans are the product of horizontal strata. These types of features are the product of uneven weathering and also lead to the formation of related features like bridges, arches, and pedestals or mushroom or balanced rocks, and hoodoos. It's important to note that in addition to wind weathering, they are also the product of freeze-thaw and water action as well. 
Anselberg means island mountain, and these isolated hills certainly form with the help of wind abrasion. But recent research on the Uluru Inselberg, found in central Australia, has pointed to fire as another factor, creating the flared slopes and steep sides common to Inselbergs. Wind also causes blowouts or deflations in sandy environments. Then we get suspension, the process when the finer dust particles are lifted high into the atmosphere in a region similarly named the suspended load. And there's desert pavement, the stuff I've been walking around on here in the Mojave Desert, where the wind blows away the small sediment pieces, leaving behind larger rocks that are wind eroded, so they have smooth surfaces, and they coat the surface a lot like pavement, and sometimes are referred to as float. It's quite the view, huh? Imagine that entire basin being filled with water. That's what it would have looked like when that was ancient Lake Tacopa. It was a really big lake and it was able to capture ashfall from hundreds of thousands of years ago. In the Pleistocene, the basins of the western U.S. were filled with water to create spectacular and large lakes like Lake Bonneville in Utah and Lake Lahontan in Nevada. Today, however, many of these lakes are more ephemeral in nature or temporary, due partly to a drying climate and partly to human interference. I've featured several of these lakes here already, from Walker Lake to Mono Lake to Owens Lake, so if you'd like to learn more about them, their stories are pretty wild. From Tufa Towers to lake bombings, deadly dams, and toxic dust, the link to those videos can be found in the description. Drying seas or lakes result in the formation of minerals known as evaporates, or water-soluble minerals that precipitate from solution during the process of evaporation. These minerals include those such as calcite, gypsum, halite, trona, and borax. Even lithium is found in these playa environments. This all makes water an even more important resource in these arid regions where water can be found underground in aquifers and even in Southern California, a place known as an underground river. Water in a desert can create what we know of as an oasis or a fertile area with water in an otherwise arid region. These regions can be surprisingly lush, having green vegetation with cottonwood trees and willows and grasses associated with river ecosystems and springs. We might be surprised to learn that a school or a town or a resort named Desert Oasis was once actually a desert oasis before being paved over. In fact, Las Vegas means the meadows. Arid ecosystems are extremely sensitive to water fluctuations, so when humans started pumping groundwater, it had devastating effects on the regions. A phenomenon known as subsidence, or the sinking of the land, occurred in some pretty dramatic examples. Pictured here is some hard-to-believe scale of subsidence, showing 1925 levels of the land to 1955 to 1977 in the San Joaquin Valley of California. That's how much land subsidence occurred. Groundwater pumping for those Central Valley crops. As a result, another feature you might come across in an arid region are deep cracks in the Earth's surface, otherwise known as fissures. These result from groundwater depletion and are common features now in places like Southern Arizona, all the way up into California. And if that wasn't crazy enough, I found it interesting that researchers have also discovered that earthquake swarms can be triggered by groundwater extraction. This was noted in the Dead Sea area as well as in Central California, where they made a direct correlation between seismicity and groundwater depletion.